So welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're really excited to have you today. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to successfully host a sprint. And I think this is really uh, topical, especially with Drupal 8 Accelerate um, and all of the community sprints that are happening all over the world, uh, particularly with uh, Drupal 8, but also just um, you know the involvement and excitement around sprinting in the Drupal community. So. Um, I think this is going to be really useful, and we're we're really lucky to have uh, Kathy and David with us today to talk about that. So welcome, and thank you for joining us. And our presenters today, Kathy and David, um, I'll let them introduce themselves. Kathy uh, is a longtime sprinter and core mentor. David is a wonderful sprinter and just hosted um, a Drupal 8 Accelerate sprint in New Jersey. So without further ado, Kathy, whenever you're Hi. ready. I'm Kathy. I'm YesDT on the internet. Uh, I work for Black Mesh. Uh, they're a hosting company, and my job is part to work on issues, part to uh, plan sprints, and also to go to them. Uh, I have a ton of experience around sprints. I have a small local sprint, which I host uh, once a month, which has between like four and six people that come to it every time. And I also work on the uh, DrupalCon sprints, which are huge and gigantic and have like 500 people. Hi, I'm David Hernandez. David Hernandez, all one word, on Drupal.org. Um, I've been uh, helping organize New Jersey events for a good five or six years now, including meetups, uh, sprints, co-workings, um, and Drupal Camp New Jersey for the past four years now. So I've had a lot of experience with different kinds of events, uh, doing different sprints, different locations, and um, doing a lot of things right and a lot of things wrong. So hopefully we can share that information with you today. <clears throat> All right, so let's get right to it. Um, the first thing, of course, is we need to talk about what these events are and what a sprint actually is for someone who's never participated. Um, a sprint um, is exactly what you see in the picture we have on the slide here. It's when people get together with their computers and they collaborate and contribute that work. And that's really the big difference between sprints and other things like meetups, is that your main goal here is to contribute the work that you do. Whether it's to Drupal Core, to different contrib projects, to documentation, no matter what it is, you're really contributing everything that you work on. We have different kinds of sprints, so you can have a really small sprint, you can have a really big sprint like we do at DrupalCon, um, and you can have sprints that are for everyone and have mentors, which is a big thing we do at DrupalCon, making sure people are around to help new people get acclimated. And you can also have focus sprints, which we're doing more of now to help get Drupal 8 out the door, which means you take your more experienced sprinters, people who are used to contributing, have gone through the process before, and they might focus on one particular subject matter, whether it's just Drupal 8 criticals or just documentation or just front end work, but they really focus all their efforts towards one goal to accomplish something. So part of planning a sprint is a lot about uh, thinking about what you're going to need. And the most important thing is that you have to have tables and chairs. I once planned a sprint and reserved a venue and did not clarify with the venue that I needed tables and chairs. And uh, we ended up scrambling at the last minute to get them. Uh, the next thing that you need, really need to think about is having uh, power directly at the tables uh, with outlet strips. And we really need super Wi-Fi. Um, there are some technical details um, on a sprint uh, planning document page that we have on Drupal.org, uh, which is Drupal.org slash core-mentoring slash sprint-resources. And uh, I would highly recommend um, going to the venue in advance and doing some testing there and checking to see 
uh, what the bandwidth is like. Uh, depending upon the amount of people that you have, um, you need a ton of bandwidth. So maybe like 60 megabits down and 20 megabits up. And you can plan on each person having two and a half devices. So you need more allowed connections than you're going to have people. Uh, and that's true no matter the size of your sprint. Uh, for larger sprints, it's really super helpful to have some uh, real life things on hand, like uh, whiteboards or uh, flip charts, uh, post it notes, name tags, and markers. But the most important thing is tables, chairs, electrical, and Wi Fi. All right, um, so your venue, this is one of the most important considerations when planning your sprint or really planning any event. Um, if you have a bad venue, you have problems with your venue, it's really problematic. So take as much time as you need to find the right place, do as much research as possible, talk to different people, and use as much as your budget as you might need to to get a better location. Right. Some of the key factors for me is make sure that your location is easy to get to. Um, don't underestimate how lazy people can be sometimes. If you have a location that has an address that's hard to find, it's hard to put into a GPS, it requires a lot of directions to get there. It's in a building that's hidden someplace. The, the front entrance is not clear, you know, all that kind of stuff. It makes it very difficult for people to get there, and it makes it so that they're less likely to come again. So try to be near a main road. Try to be in a building that's easy to find and easy for people to research on their own. Something like a library is great because if people don't have the address, they can at least Google the name of the library and find out where it is. But if you're in some office complex somewhere, it might be a little more difficult for people to find the exact building. Um, a well-known shopping center is another good idea. Um, and any location that has its own website, so maybe run by a management company or by a Drupal agency, so they have their address listed on their website, it just makes it easier for people to find. Um, have good signs. So one thing I like to do is put signs right on the front door with a big Drupal icon on it. So it's a giant flag for people that are walking up to the building, let them know this is the right entrance, this is the right location. Have signs in the building directing people where to go, where the stairs are where the elevator is, where the suite is, where you know that's the, the actual sprint location is. Uh, make sure the doors are open and unlocked all the time. Make sure hours are visible for people and they know exactly when you're going to start and when you're going to end. Uh, make sure the building is accessible. So if uh, people have a handicap, they're able to get into the building. And that's, that's also great for everybody because sometimes you go and get supplies, like you order food. And it's nice to have accessible entrances so you can get into the building easier and use the elevator, not have to walk up flights of stairs with all the food. Um, also, be close to parking or public transit, depending on you know if you're in a city or on the suburbs. Uh, if people have to use street parking, pay for meters, pay for a parking garage, things like that, they're less likely to attend and they're less likely to come back. So try to find a location that will have free parking, that has consistent parking. Um, and that's important for the size of your event as well. If you're used to running smaller events and people just use street parking, that might be fine when you don't expect more than 10 or 20 people. But if you're going to have an event with 100 people, street parking might be a problem. So take that under consideration. And be consistent with your locations. Uh, I think this is just as important. Much of your attendance is going to be based on convenience. So if you run meetups and you use one location, keep using that same location. Be consistent. People will develop habits and they will know how to get there. They will understand how long it takes for them to get there. They will understand where to park or what train to take. They'll know exactly how to get in the building. They'll get used to where the office is. Um, and it makes it easier to then host a sprint because you can say, well, the exact same place we hold our meetup, this is where the sprint's going to be. It's very easy pe for people. Um, and uh, be close to food or drink. Uh, 
if you have a large event, you probably are going to cater it, which is great. But if you can't, make sure you're close by to something that you know people can just go out quickly and easily and get food. Or if you end up in a location that's too far from something like that, at least communicate that to people so that they know ahead of time and they can make preparations. All right. So if you're in a, a very bus busy business area and there's lots of restaurants nearby, cafes, the like, people can leave quickly and get to something. But if you're not near that, they might need to bring food and water, coffee, or whatever with them. So just let them know ahead of time if you're going to do that. Yeah, um, letting people know ahead of time is really super regarding any of these things. Uh, there is no such thing as too much advanced communication. Uh, there's a really great um, resource, uh, which we'll have a link to at the end, which is a, a model view culture post on uh, getting people to attend your conference who have trouble moving around. And uh, they will not show up and assume that you've thought about these things in advance. So when you communicate that you've thought about uh, where it is, uh, how you're going to enter, what the location is like, uh, whether or not it's accessible, uh, how long it takes to walk from the front door to the location. When you communicate that stuff ahead of time, it will increase your attendance on the day. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, let's go back a little bit. Uh, we skipped a slide. No, no that was good. Uh, so uh, during the presentation, uh, you can ask questions in the Q&A section uh, as we're going along. It's totally okay. And then we'll also do a Q&A at the end in addition. And we'll have a survey at the end. So uh, along those same lines, uh, communicating in advance whether or not you will be providing the food or if be expected to uh, take a break and go get food on their, on their own uh, is really nice. If you have uh, food that you're providing, uh, do a lot of different options. And you don't necessarily need to poll people in advance to find out if they're gluten-free or vegetarian or vegan. Uh, if you communicate uh, with the people who are providing the food that you need all of those options um, for everyone. And then it's really helpful to have signs which label the ingredients of the food and then people can pick what they uh, need to eat on their own. Uh, we have a slight tradition um, of in the past, we would have sprints and we would say, oh, let's order some pizzas or let's have coffee all the time. And we're getting a li little bit uh, wiser now and realizing that what we provide um, is in part a reflection of how we respect the people who are attending. So uh, recently, we have a lot more examples of having uh, healthy food uh, for the people who are working all day long, sprinting, um, and that is really great in terms of uh, what they want and also uh, in terms of the output that we're going to get from people. Um, they do better when we provide them with better food. Uh, a lot of times when you're planning an event, uh, we think about the work hours from the morning and until the evening, uh, but especially, well, I guess it's no matter whether or not you're having people from out of town or in town, uh, there is a really nice chance to um, get together at the end of the day. So when you're thinking about what to, what, what to do after the sprint, uh, if you can have a, a social thing on, at the same location, you will have more people show up for it. 
Um, it's really good to have choices that are not alcohol centric. Uh, there are a lot of conversations happening at the moment around tech events and alcohol. And we can do a really good job of incorporating feedback from those wider conversations by making sure that we have uh, as high quality choices uh, for things to drink, uh, like tea and craft sodas. Um, and it will make people feel safer and more respected. Uh, it's also really nice th uh, to have some kind of social thing in the evening where people can hear each other and actually communicate. Yeah, uh, we, we actually had a change this year at my Drupal camp. We used to do an after party at a bar nearby. And this year we changed it up and actually did the after party in a private room that we rented in the next building over. The number of people that actually stayed for that was significantly greater than when we just met at the bar. So people do prefer that. It, it was a much nicer time. We were in a private room. It was quieter. Everyone was there who was from the event. And it, it was a much better experience. All right, marketing communications. Um, for a lot of people, especially for developers, we know that you're maybe not the best communicators, and so you're not great at this and you may not want to do it, but it's kind of too bad. You're going to have to get good at it. <laughs> or find somebody who knows how to do it well. Because um, if you want to get attendance, you have to communicate with people. You have to let them know that you're having an event. You have to use social media outlets. You have to be very clear and specific with your information. That's probably the biggest point. As soon as you um, make decisions and you have things set in stone, like your date, your venue, things like that, let people know and give them specifics. Don't just say like, oh, this weekend, or we're going to be here someplace, or just or tell them the location, but don't give them the exact address. No. Give people the exact address. Give them contact information. Give them a map link if necessary. Give them directions. Um, give them the specific hours that you're going to start and you're going to end. You know, tell people if you're going to have food catered and tell them what those food options are. If you're not going to, tell them that you're not going to so that people can make preparations. Right? Usually it's fine if you, if you don't cater for lunch. People can bring their own lunch or make their own arrangements, but they don't know that if you don't tell them ahead of time. Right? So be specific about it and let them know exactly what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. Um, depending on what kind of event you're going to have, if it's going to be small, it's going to be big, tell people. If you're going to have a focused sprint that's on a particular subject matter, tell people exactly what it is and what's expected of them so they know ahead of time how to prepare for that. Or they know ahead of time that it's an event that's not for them and they shouldn't show up. Right. We like to think that every event is you know, inclusive and it's for everybody, but sometimes we do have events that are very specific and it might not be right for that person. That's okay. Just let people know and they can make the decision that it's not best for them and maybe they don't attend that event, but they attend the event that's two weeks later or a month later. That is for everybody. It's okay to do that. What you don't want to have happen is people not have the right information, show up, and then have a bad experience because then they will leave, they will be less likely to show up again, um, and we really don't want that. So just be clear with everyone, and usually everything will be just fine. Um, I also like to have a contact person that's specific. Uh, if you're running a big event like a camp, you probably have a camp email address and a camp Twitter account and all that kind of stuff, so that's okay. If it's a smaller event, have one person who's handling the communications. So assign that person and tell people if you have questions, you can contact this person. Maybe that person is just you because you're the organizer and you might be the only person. But let them know how they can reach you, you know, either through your Drupal.org profile or they can find you on IRC and ask you questions or they can ping you on Twitter or whatever. But have an actual person that people can communicate with as opposed to just posting something on groups at Drupal.org and maybe you don't go by often enough to see if there's comments or anything like that. And a lot of people don't post comments, but they might email you or just tweet you or ping you on IRC or something like that. Yeah, there is no such thing as too much advanced communication. And the 
sooner you can announce the date of your sprint, mm -hmm. the better. Um, even local people uh, need time to arrange their lives uh, in advance. So they need to make arrangements for childcare uh, or get time off of work. And the sooner you can announce a date, the better. Uh, and wide broadcast announcements, uh, like making uh, make an event on groups.drupal.org, which ends up causing something to show up on the DrupalCal map, uh, using your local meetup to announce a special sprint. All of those things are really good, but something else that helps a lot is personal communication. So emailing specific people and asking them, like, can you come? Is this a good time for you? Uh, we really want you to go. Uh, going that extra mile will also increase uh, the amount of people that show up for your sprint. One of the things that you can do in advance is make sure that a code of conduct is posted publicly. So you can mention it in, uh, in your post. Uh, if you have a website for your sprint, you can link to it there. Um, we recently held MidCamp and uh, it was in the footer uh, on every single page of the website. Um, this is a big deal in terms of publishing ahead of time so that people understand that it is safe for them to attend your event. Kathy, uh, quick question. What do you mean by, can you elaborate on safe to attend the event? Uh, like what would, uh, what would the code of conduct uh, encompass for someone that might be newer to the community? So um, the code of conduct usually will say something like, uh, we treat each other with respect, um, we don't tolerate harassment in terms of uh, gender identity, um, your body type, uh, all of those different things that can come up. And one of the most important parts of a code of conduct is that it will explicitly say, if you have an issue at our event, this is the person to talk to. And it will give an email address, uh, a text number, and their name, and a way to identify them at the event. So uh, at an opening, somebody uh, would mention the code of conduct and they'll say, hey, if you have any issues, go talk to so-and-so, so-and-so, please stand up. So it has a really easily identifiable person uh, that is a point of contact at the event to talk to in case um, anything comes up. And the other important thing about having a code of conduct is talking to the organizers and volunteers that are at your event, which could just be you, uh, or it could be a group of people that are helping you and letting them know how they should respond when somebody comes up to them and says, hey, this thing happened and I don't feel good about it and making it very clear that the way that you respond to that is with finding more information about what happened and redirecting to the specific person uh, who is the point of contact uh, and let them handle it. So in general, not, not challenging whether or not something happened, but gathering information and directing them to the person who's going to deal with whatever has happened. And there are uh, open source code of conducts available. You don't have to make up your own. So if you're having organizing an event, you don't have to be an expert or have a ton of experience. You can just go to one of the example code of conducts and just copy it and put it up and say, hey, we have a code of conduct. It's really super easy uh, to do, actually. Um, there's some examples. So drupal.org slash DCOC and also uh, uh, Los Angeles uh, DrupalCon coming up has a code of conduct. And there are some other open source ones 
uh, on the internet uh, that you can search for. So you don't have to make it up from scratch. There's a lot of resources to do, but the important things are to say that your sprint has one and have a person uh, who is the primary uh, point of contact. Great. Um, and also just as a note, uh, things are kept confidential uh, while uh, working on whatever the situation may be. Uh, I think that's really important for people to know so that they feel like they can share. Okay, funding, that's, this is another big one. Um, so if you're running a small event, obviously you can do that fairly cheap. So we don't want to discourage anyone to think that you need a huge amount of resources and a huge amount of funding to pull off any events. You can, you can do something small, you can do something um, free, um, and you, know, you just need to tailor that for your local group. But if you start getting into larger events, multi-day events, um, you're going to have to start worrying about money. Locations cost money, catering costs money, there's a lot of things to consider. So you have to figure out some funding sources. Um, look for local sponsors. If there are any Drupal agencies or web agencies in your area, they are probably willing to give you some sponsor money. Um, they like to help out. They like to um, give people money for sprints because they appreciate the cause and are willing to have these events. And they can do things like uh, let you use their office as your venue for free. So that's a great way for them to give back. Uh, but usually a small amount of money, maybe one or two hundred dollars, is not a big deal for an agency, and that might help you out a lot. Um, but if you're going to try to get a lot of sponsors for your big event, you need visibility. Uh, you have to have a website, you have to have a social media presence, you have to have a way to publicize the sponsors. If you don't have that, you're not going to be able to get a lot of sponsorship. Um, so keep that in mind. If, if it's not something you think you're going to be able to do, you probably shouldn't try to host too large of an event. Um, so uh, I would say the first thing, if you've never done this before and you've never contacted sponsors, is to talk to the Drupal Association. They know exactly how to do this. All right? The DA hosts a lot of events. They know all the sponsors. They know all the Drupal agencies. They know who the point of contact is for each one of them. So talk to them. They can help you find out who's in your area, who might be a, a good person to talk to, and get the ball rolling for you. Also talk to the DA about the cultivation grants. This is something that they've given out for a long time. Um, I don't remember exactly how much it is. Lauren, do you know how much the grants are now? Um, I believe, Lauren, uh, no, I I think believe the, about a thousand, seven fifty, a thousand, depending on uh, you know what the uh, ask is for. Oh, that's gone up. So I think when I, I could got be it, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I, I don't make the like, decision. It's a it's a community uh, led group that makes the decision and awards the amount. But um, I okay. I think um, I saw seven fifty one time. But the point being. Uh, talk to the DA about that because that is money that they will give you and you can use for startup. Um, when we first ran Drupal Camp New Jersey, that was the first thing that we did. We got money from the DA and we were able to use that for things that we needed right away, like down payments for catering and venues and different things like that. I don't encourage you to spend money out of your own pocket. Find a way to get some funding resources so that you don't have to do this. This shouldn't, you're organizing, so it shouldn't be a huge burden on you. Try to find some other sources for that income. Um, and talk to your venues. If you have to rent a space, talk to the people who are running that venue. You might be able to get discounts or even get it for free. And you might have to talk to them about it to do it. They may not list that information on their website or whatever place that you, you do the renting. Um, I've, we've done this with libraries where you can rent a library space and it might have a small fee. Some of them are more expensive. It might cost $100 a day. But if you talk to the library, they may know that you're a nonprofit, you're a tech group, you're an open source group, and they might sponsor you and let you use the venue for free or at a discount. Um, so definitely talk to them first about it. Don't just assume that the cost listed on a website somewhere is exactly what the cost is going to be. 
And then if your your budget is tight and you don't have a lot of funding sources, uh, be careful about what you spend your money on and worry about the things that you have to have, not just things that you think are going to be fun. So your venue is one of the most important things. If you need to spend extra money to get a better venue and then not pay for something else, I would do that. So you don't need T-shirts. You don't need stickers. You don't have to have... Um, more coffee or the fancier food option or you know different things you don't have to have badges and lanyards and things like that you need to worry about the sprint itself and make sure that the sprint is successful first and foremost so if getting a better venue means you cut out something else I would probably do that um, <clears throat> and then of course be transparent um, this is all nonprofit People in your local community might be interested in where the money's coming from and how it's being spent. The DA might be interested in that. Um, so just share it with them. This protects everyone else, but it also protects you. Um, so the more people that see the finances, the better off you're going to be. Uh, you might make a mistake in your accounting. You might get overcharged for something. Um, and you may not realize it if you're not an experienced person handling budgets and finances. But if somebody else sees that, you know, that's a mistake that they can help you correct. So just be very transparent and clear about it. And lastly, if you really have to, don't be afraid to charge uh, for tickets to your events. Um, we've seen that for camps, obviously, but sometimes we actually will charge tickets for attending a sprint as well if we just need the money to handle catering or something like that. It, it's, it's not a big deal, especially if you're dealing with a small amount. Uh, 10 or $20 or something like that, it makes it easier to coordinate food instead of having 20 people try to pull out whatever money they have in their pocket to put it together or go get lunch or something like that. If basically those people give you the money ahead of time, you can arrange for the catering and just have everything done ahead of time. Um, and charging tickets is actually a good way to manage your attendance. Um, so if you just have a free event and you say, hey, anybody who wants to come can just come, you don't really have a good idea who's going to show up. But if you actually set up tickets for the event and have people pay for them, you're essentially having them register and give you money. It's a little more formal, and those people that actually go through the process are a lot more likely to actually attend the event. Absolutely. It's really hard to plan things when you don't know. Who is going to show up? All right, so now we're going to get past the, the logistics part of things and talk about the event itself. Um, and the audience is really your attendees, right? So this is incredibly important. You need to um, think carefully about the events that you're trying to organize and make sure that it's tailored for the people who are attending, right? You are running it for them. Right? So if you have a local community and you want to run a sprint for those people, you have to know who those people are. You have to know what they're interested in, what their experience level is, um, what things they're familiar with, and what they're not familiar with. It, And make sure that your event is geared towards them. If you don't have a lot of experienced people, then having a highly focused sprint is probably not right for them. And they're probably less likely to show up. But if you hold a general sprint where it's more about mentoring and getting people started and you have a lot of exercises and organization around um, new people getting acclimated, they're going to think it's more fun. They're going to show up. They're going to learn a lot of things. If you have a lot of people who aren't developers, don't have just a developer-only sprint, work on documentation, um, work on organization, work on, uh, you know, tasks that are, are great for new people, like doing some of the issue queue triage and, and you know, different things like that and, and just uh, you know, teaching people new things. Those people are going to show up if they see that the event matches what they're interested in doing. Um, and think about the kind of event you're running and who you want to communicate that to. So if you're running a one-day event, that is not an event that is geared towards people who are traveling a long distance. So don't try to communicate with them or try to recruit those people to show up. 
Uh, if someone's coming from out of town, from several hours away or they, a flight away, your event really needs to be at least two or three days long, at least. Um, no one wants to fly in, stay at a hotel, you know, do everything associated with taking time off from work or arranging for babysitters or the like to come in for like a six-hour event. That doesn't make sense. They're not going to come. So don't gear your communications to them. Gear it, your communications and the topic of your events to the people that are local. If you are having an event, uh, a sprint, where your target audience is people who have not yet contributed and you want to uh, introduce contributing to them, you can expect that you'll have a bunch of setup time and need to plan for that. So if you have a one-day event um, and it's geared towards uh, new contributors, um, you'll spend probably about half of your day getting people oriented uh, as to what a sprint is like and getting them ready to work on issues. Um, you can mitigate that a little bit by having a repeat event. Uh, so one of the things we do in my local community is we have a monthly sprint um, so we get people coming back over and over again. We don't have to have a four day long event. Uh, it's more reasonable. We have a half day event, but we have it every month. So that setup time happens once and then people come back at, to the next thing and they are more ready to go. If you're only gonna have a sprint uh, once, it can be really advantageous uh, to have it be a, a multi day thing. Um, the day that you have it depends upon who you're trying to attract. Um, so it might be uh, on a weekend, which is typically not a work day for people, uh, or it could be on a Monday or a Friday and people might be able to convince their employers to send them. It's tricky when we're doing something like this because uh, not everybody has free time to come to an event um, and I think we need to think we need to be thoughtful uh, when we're planning something about who we're trying to attract and whether or not they can attend the event on their own cost. Uh, and it's okay to uh, allocate part of your budget to actually paying somebody to attend a sprint. Um, this helps a lot in terms of uh, diversity in our open source projects if we have some money set aside from that because if we don't do that what we get are only the people who can afford to fund themselves to both attend in terms of travel and also spend the time at the event. So the audience thing relates back to the funding thing, especially in terms of thinking about having a diverse set of people who can be there. There's a thing in the Drupal community which is really makes me smile, which is that we have this thing called mentoring that, uh, that happens at sprints. And so one of the things you want to think about when you're planning a sprint is uh, do you need any mentors and how many do you need? And that depends upon uh, the target audience of your sprint who's attending and also who those mentors are. 
So um, if you're having a small sprint uh, and it's focused on a topic, your mentor is probably just going to be the person who has experience in that topic. They're going to be the lead for your sprint and that will happen very organically, especially if you have a, a small event. Uh, but if you're having something larger, uh, you can plan on having, uh, you can plan to need to have uh, a few people who are not going to be doing the work, working uh, on issues uh, and improving Drupal themselves, but who are going to dedicate their time at the event to helping other people figure out how to get things accomplished. Uh, in the project. If your mentors are experienced, they can probably help eight people throughout the day. Uh, if your mentors are new, then they are going to need, uh, you're going to need more mentors because they're going to uh, focus on fewer people throughout the day. Um, it's really important to uh, have anybody, whether it's an official mentor or an organic thing, to make sure that people are working together and then the mentoring happens automatically. If you do have a big event though, um, it's nice to ask for people to sign up to mentor in advance and also have a way to identify who the mentors are. Uh, different colored t-shirts are nice um, or certain kinds of uh, badges. So you, people know they can go up to this person and they can ask for something and get the information that they need. Yeah, and I'm, I'm big on the one-on-one -on -one mentoring, especially for smaller local events. I think it's uh, when, when people get started and they've never contributed before, they are having trouble with their local development environment, things like that, it can be a really frustrating experience and it's really nice for those people when they have that one person who just sits next to them and helps them the whole time that they're there, make sure that they solve all the problems that they have. That creates a, a really great experience for that person and they're more likely to come back. When we're talking about these sprints, we are talking about in-person events. So the whole point is that we get together in person. Uh, and so when we do that, working together really is what makes these things shine. Kathy, we have a question really quick. Um, do you look for any no. qualifications for an official sure. mentor? Oh, that's interesting. Um, well, for one thing, I would say make sure that the mentor wants to do it. <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes I I would say sometimes you go to an event and new people will show up and they go, oh, why don't you just talk to Joe and like he'll like help you work through that problem. Well, make sure that Joe actually wants to do that first and that he doesn't think he's just there to sprint and doesn't want to be bothered with something like that. So enthusiasm definitely helps and wanting helps. Yeah, setting up expectations ahead of time, both for people who are attending maybe their first sprint and also for people who are attending their 20th sprint. Uh, is really good. Um, qualifications I, are really quite low though in terms of who can mentor and who can't because if you have, uh, well let's, for example, let's take DrupalCon. So at DrupalCon we have uh, a sprint day which is get involved with core and so our expectations for people who mentor during that day are that they have previous experience working on core and we will have mentors that maybe have worked on uh, three, ish three core issues or 300 core issues um, and any of those people are going to be valuable mentors because the person who's worked on three core issues can help somebody work on something for their first time because they've done it before, they know the basic things. The person who's worked on 300 core issues will help somebody else who maybe is more in the weeds of something, uh, some difficult problem. 
So I, I think the qualifications for mentors are around their expectations. They really need to be able to devote their time while they're mentoring to not accomplishing anything themselves and understand that their job is to help other people accomplish things. And if they have those expectations and a little bit of experience um, in the area of the sprint, then things are going to work out fine. Uh, we do not turn away mentors at DrupalCon. You can sign up to mentor and I'm like, great, you're, you're on the team. Uh, it, yeah, so, I, would, so, I would say that the only real qualification is just experience working in the issue queues and experience contributing because that's what you're mentoring on. You don't need to have expertise in the software. So you're not necessarily there to answer every technical question that people have. You're there to help them get started, navigate the issue queue, use Drupal.org, understand where the tools are, things like that. Yeah, so for example, if, if I'm at an event and somebody asks me a question about Twig, I don't know anything about it, but that doesn't mean I can't mentor them at the sprint and help them uh, work on an issue about that because my job as a mentor is really to expose to this person how to do the work and how to find out answers to their questions. I don't actually need to know answers to their questions. I just need to show them how they can find out the answers to their questions. That's much more empowering uh, and prepares that person to continue to contribute even after the event if they can know how you find out things, not just the answers to things that, that they have questions about. Yeah, it's, it's also good to communicate that to the people who are attending because you do get people that will show up and expect that the mentors are there to help them with a project or answer all their Drupal questions and things like that. And then they may get frustrated, like, what, you're a mentor, why are you not, you know, able to solve all my technical problems? But they're not there for that. So make sure people understand that before they come. Is there, uh, really quick, is there a pro tip you guys have in uh, the past on how to identify your mentors to the general uh, attendees at your sprint? At a small event, at the beginning of the day, I would just have people stand up and say, hey, this is Sally, you know, they're, they can help you with whatever uh, questions you have. Uh, at big events, um, uh, if you can plan in advance, a special colored t-shirt actually helps. Uh, but if you can't do that, just any kind of like, a, like throw a sticker on somebody's shoulder and, uh, and so they can walk around with that throughout the day. Yeah, you guys did that at Bogota, right? Yeah, that that was really good. And what we what we did um, is we Bogota had like th uh, 270 people at the event, and we had 101 people at the sprint. Uh, we had a ton of people at the sprint, and we didn't have special bright yellow T-shirts or anything like that. What we had was um, black T-shirts, uh, and um, we had a pile of them that Bluehost provided, uh, they had just brought a bunch of t-shirts and they just happened to all be a dark color. Uh, other people were already wearing a dark colored shirt that day. What we did was we sent somebody out the day before to the local like hardware store and they bought um, a bright colored tape. So we had green tape. So we just put like stripes on the backs of people's black t-shirts and they were bright green and then you knew throughout the day. So uh, it's, I think having some kind of identifying symbol on people um, helps reduce the barrier. It makes people more likely when they have a question to be willing to ask it because they're like, oh, that's what this person is for. I'm supposed to ask them all the things. And it just, it reduces that um, friction uh, and it makes people much more willing to ask things that they might be a little uh, reluctant to ask. Awesome, that's great. All right. uh, when running your sprints, make sure that you have goals. Right? You, 
you're not going to be very successful if you decide to run an event and you say, well, we're just we're going to handle all these things, we're going to, the venue, the catering, all that sort of stuff, and then everyone will just come and we'll just sit around and we'll just do stuff. What stuff are you going to do? Right? You, you need to figure out exactly how your event's going to go. Are you going to have mentoring or not? If you are going to have mentoring, figure out what the goals are for the mentoring. Right? Make sure that uh, people have accomplishments. If it's a focus sprint, uh, make sure that um, you're focused on it and you're working on issues specific for that. But manage those expectations. Don't think that you're going to run a general sprint and everyone's going to work on everything and you're going to solve all the problems in the world. Right? That's not going to happen. It's never going to happen. So keep it uh, simpler. Know what makes sense. And for me, what makes sense is making sure that everyone who comes to your event accomplishes something, no matter what that is. So an experienced person might just work on one issue and get it solved, and for them, that's a success. For someone who's brand new, they may just go through the mentoring process and get used to all the tools, get their laptop set up, and at the end of the day, comment on one or two issues, maybe write a patch and upload it, and that's it, but they at least get to that point where they've done something. Make sure every single person at your sprint has an experience like that. If that happens, they'll feel good about it and they're more likely to come back, right? So this is where it's important to communicate your type of event to everyone so that they understand what they're getting involved with, right? So that if the event is not right for them, they won't attend the event, which is okay. But if they attend the event with different expectations than what you had, that's when they're going to have a bad time. Mm -hmm. And when yeah. I say don't do it all, I don't just refer to the sprint itself. I'm referring to you as the organizer. Right? Don't try to organize a big sprint by yourself, handle the venue, handle all the catering, do the mentoring, think you're also going to do sprinting as well. That's just not going to work. If you're large enough that you need multiple people to volunteer, get multiple volunteers, have people concentrate on their particular task, and just worry about doing that task and doing it well. So if you are mentoring, just mentor. Don't worry about sprinting. If you are just handling the catering, just handle the catering and make sure that all works well. Yeah, I, w I would say that if part of your goal of your sprint is includes new people the the most difficult thing to accomplish is having people click save on their comment on an issue and uh, encouraging them to do that will give them a result that they can look back on and say yes I did something uh, so helping people do that is really good if 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 you're having a sprint for um, encouraging people to start contributing. Uh, before the sprint, um, it's a lot of work for the organizer. Uh, so the organizer of the sprint might want to uh, pick a different person to specifically handle this, but it is really important to uh, go through uh, whatever kind of project you have and pick out some issues that are going to be good to work on um, the next day or that weekend. Um, the other thing that's important to do beforehand uh, is remind people of all the logistics. Uh, tell them, you know, come, this is what you need to bring, this is what you should wear, this is how to get to it, like all of the reminders. You cannot communicate too much in advance. It really makes for a much better uh, event. Um, if you're having a large sprint, you will need to warn a uh, free node that you're going to have a bunch of people connecting on IRC from the same IP address. Uh, if you're having a large sprint, uh, you need to warn the Drupal Association so they can make sure that the there are enough test bots uh, up to handle um, the amount of uh, uh, patches that are going to be coming up in the queue. And the contact information for who to, um, to tell about those things is in the, uh, we'll have a link for that for you at the end. But you want to uh, do that a couple of days beforehand. 
uh, use whatever tool you're comfortable with that people will have access to uh, for looking at what issues you're going to work on. Uh, so if you're leading um, a contrib project or if you're uh, a lead uh, on a component of core, you might tag issues with the upcoming sprint thing. Um, if you're not uh, a maintainer of a specific thing, then you're not going to use tags. You're going to just make a Google Doc uh, and put a bunch of issue uh, links in them. Or you're going to make a Trello board and keep that up to date. Uh, use whatever tools you want, but you definitely want to pick out the issues uh, to focus on in advance. Yeah, if you're expecting uh, new people to come, it's really handy to have one or two really simple tasks that you know need to get done that you could do really quick yourself, but just hold on to them, like writing a change record or doing an issue summary update or like something like that. So like you know when there's someone new without walking through the door, like, okay, I can give this specific thing to you. I don't have to spend a half an hour trying to find an issue for you to work on. When, um, when you're actually at the event, the main benefit that we have is that we're all in the same place, uh, so we might as well work together. And I think it's uh, difficult to maybe explain to your boss or the person who's funding the event, but it, it is not important how many patches are put on how many issues. The important outcome that we have is working together and moving a very small set of issues further. Uh, and so doing reviews is really important to do at a sprint. Uh, and review something multiple times throughout the day so that it gets closer and closer to what we call RTBC, which is um, reviewed and tested by the community. And it means that uh, something has happened and it's gotten to a sufficient point where it can actually go into the project, like the issue is done. And so adjusting expectations of the people who are funding it, the people who are organizing it, and the people who are, who are working on it, uh, instead of let's do a ton and ton of work to let's work on a small amount of things but let's get it done is really nice and it will not only be good for the project, but good for the people who are working on it to see that their work was effective. All right, um, and at the sprint, make sure you document everything that you can. Um, it's easy to forget it while, to, you know, to do all the documentation while you're there, um, and it might be nice to assign that task to another person that this is all they do, but make sure you do things like uh, record all of the issues that get worked on at that sprint so you can share that information later with other people and you can keep track of those issues and see that they get done and see that the work you did at the sprint was effective in moving all those issues forward. Um, take notes about what things worked and what didn't work and do it during the event or right after the event so it's fresh in your mind and you know things like okay we did have a problem with the doors I need a checklist of all the things I have to do before the event next time and this is what that checklist is or these food options didn't work we ordered coffee and we actually had too much coffee or we had too little coffee so we can adjust our budget next time do all those things during the event and immediately after the event while they're fresh and take pictures because you're going to want to remember the event. You're going to remember, want to remember who attended the event. It's easy to look through pictures and remember, oh, that's right, those people were there. And if you're going to blog about it afterwards, it's nice to include those pictures so you can show everybody how many people were there and what a good time you had. So go ahead and do that. Um, but when you're taking pictures, make sure that you're careful about asking for people's permission before taking their pictures and posting them online. Um, a lot of people don't want their pictures taken, they don't want them online. Um, just be respectful of that choice. Um, and usually we don't have too many problems. Uh, one thing that I do sometimes is if there's one person in the room or a couple people who don't want to have their picture taken, have them take the pictures. That's a real nice simple solution, then you don't have to worry about it. Um, and Kathy, why don't you tell them what you guys did at MidCamp, which I thought was actually a really great solution. 
So at MidCamp, we had two different color lanyards. We had green lanyards people could pick if they uh, did not want their picture used, and blue lanyards if they were okay with their picture being used. And um, we also had people whose like one task we asked them to do was like take a bunch of pictures, and it was really helpful. And there were a couple of pictures which I was looking at after the event which were posted online and I'm like hey there's a person in this picture with a green lanyard and we took their picture down. It was made it super easy to know whether or not a picture was okay to use uh, later. Um, the other nice thing to do especially if you're having a multi-day event is to um, summarize the work that was done that day and put that online for each day of the sprint. Uh, that happened in New Jersey when we did the menu links sprint and it happened at the um, CI sprint that was just in Portland and it really helps people uh, not like decide to attend the second day of the sprint but what it helps them do is decide that they're going to attend something in the future. So publishing a wrap-up blog post and including pictures uh, makes people see what happens so they know what a sprint is like and they can identify themselves as somebody who should attend it in the future. So it will increase future attendance when you do all this really good communication. Yeah, and the, these post write-ups are actually quite good for letting us all understand how effective some of the sprints are, which is really helpful for the community, for the project, for the DA, for sponsors, for everybody. Okay, uh, last, of course, for your event is to have fun. This, I actually had to add this slide to remind myself to talk about this because it's so easy to forget that, you know, these events, all the events that you're running, they're about the people, right? You're running a sprint or any kind of event because you care about your local community and you want to run a social event, you know, so make sure that everyone that's there is having a pleasant experience. Make sure your attendees have a pleasant experience, your volunteers have a pleasant experience, and that you as an organizer are having a good experience, right? Don't take on too many responsibilities or try to host an event that is too big for what you're capable of and what your resources are. We don't want you to get too stressed out about it, right? That doesn't make sense. If you're having too many problems and you think it's too much of a burden, just scale your event back. You know, ask for help, get more volunteers. But if anything is happening, either for your attendees or your volunteers or your organizers, that's really a problem that you need to do something about. Right? Don't burden yourself. Don't create a bad environment for your attendees. And if any of that is happening, just ask for help. You can talk to the DA if you need help. You can reach out to some of your local mentors and experienced contributors reach out to the core mentor group, the core mentor leadership, and ask them for advice, ask them you know, what you might have to do about certain situations. If you need conflict resolution, talk to the DA. And if you're really not sure what to do, find one of us. Uh, talk to Lauren, talk to, find me or Kathy. We both have contact forms on our, uh, our Drupal.org profiles. We're on IRC all the time. If you really think you need help and you don't know where to turn, Turn to one of us, we'll give you advice, we'll tell you what to do. Yeah, um, it's much better to scale back your event and yeah. have it uh, do less so that you can enjoy it. It's, mm, it's almost always people who are doing this on their own time, so they're not doing it as part of their job. So if it isn't fun, people aren't going to want to go. And as an organizer, it should be enjoyable for you too. Yeah, you are but, a volunteer. People should be respectful of your time and energy. Uh, so if it's too much for you, just scale it back. So a lot of this like documenting that we were talking about comes in really handy after the event and it is super helpful to make a blog post about your sprint, um, make a comment uh, on the announcement of your event so that people know what happened and thank anybody who volunteered and your sponsors. That's one of the ways that they get paid if they're not getting paid is by recognition. So uh, dish it out liberally. Uh, and then 
uh, after your event, think about um, what you want to do differently next time and share that with the world. It will help future planners plan things. Uh, so we we talked a lot about like all these things, right? The logistics and the planning and what you have to do at the event. Um, and it seems kind of overwhelming and it also varies depending upon what kind of event you're going to have, uh, whether or not you're going to have something small or something big. Yeah, so for small sprints, and you can host a sprint of any kind, any shape, any form. You know, just tailor it to what your resources are. Um, but for a small sprint, concentrate on your location. Um, your venue is going to be the most important part. If you have 10 people showing up or fewer than that, you don't have to worry about catering. You don't have to worry about sponsors. You don't need T-shirts. You don't need stickers. You don't need any of these things. Just worry about having the right venue with properly working Wi-Fi, and then your basic logistics you know, that you have power strips and things like that, and that's about it. For a larger event, it's going to need a lot more planning in advance, and you're going to need a lot of help. You're going to need volunteers to help with the logistics ahead of time, and these don't have to be people that are necessarily good at working on issues. This can be a whole new people, a pool of people to draw on. You're going to need to be a lot more organized uh, in terms of communicating with your volunteers and the people who are involved with planning. And it, uh, everything just needs to be done uh, ahead of time, way ahead of time, the bigger your sprint gets. So you can totally handle a gigantic sprint, uh, but it means a lot more planning in advance. Uh, we have uh, a, a lot of things that we talked about and we have links for them uh, which we're going to share with you uh, later. We're going to post those slides. Um, but the main thing to do if you want more detail about planning a sprint is to check out the sprint resources page that we have that is a child of the core mentoring page on Drupal.org. So it's Drupal.org slash core dash mentoring slash sprint resources. And uh, this is the, like the canonical place to go to when you're like, oh my god, I'm planning a sprint. What the heck should I do? This is it. Come here and if uh, if there's not something that answers your question about sprint planning on this page, uh, let one of us know and we'll improve the document. If you think of something to improve, uh, this is something anybody can edit. Uh, so you can improve this page yourself. Uh, and then we have a ton more links which we will uh, share with you later. Yeah, I guess that's it. That is it. We had um, a couple of questions. One uh, was about, um, and this is, uh, I'm sure, a sticky situation for uh, others. Um, how do you address personal hygiene uh, prior to the event and, um, you know, treat it proactively uh, before um, getting into a group setting? Has this ever happened to either of you? Well, I know that um, one of the things that we might send out in an announcement before the event is we'll remind people of uh, what kind of weather they're expecting and uh, like, hey, it might be cold or it might be super hot so people know how to dress ahead of time. But uh, I don't think that particular thing has come up at any event that I've been at, so I I would plan on not addressing it in advance and just dealing with it um, with the particular individuals involved and making recommendations I, for the future. I've come across that in the past, not at any Drupal events, thankfully, um, but other things unrelated. And I, I agree with Kathy. I don't think it's something that probably occurs often enough that you would address it in advance, like sending out emails saying, hey, make sure you take a shower before you show up. Right. But if it happens at an event, um, you probably need to at least keep an eye on it. You're probably not going to do anything about it the first time, but if it's a particular individual who comes to multiple events and it's a problem, then you do need to address it. 
Um, I would probably encourage you to talk to the DA about some conflict resolution if you don't know how to handle that on a personal level. But at some point, you, you're going to have to do that. You're going to have to talk to that individual and let them know that this is a concern. Maybe they don't know about it. Maybe they do. But um, that kind of problem, the, the, the issue is we don't want to offend anyone and we don't want to tell pe we don't turn people away. But they also create a problem for everyone else who's attending. So if it's really a major issue and that person does not want to address it, and it means excluding that person, you might have to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I would just say overall, um, you know, make sure that sensitivity and uh, discretion is used uh, when you're addressing the issue, um, which, you know, would be common sense for any particular sensitive uh, topic. We do have another question. Um, what kind of return should or can we provide a Sprint sponsor? So one of the things that is really nice is if a Sprint sponsor can actually attend the event at, or send one of their people that's part of their organization to the event and then have that person um, say like something at the event, either in the beginning or at lunch or something like that and just say, you know, like give them five minutes and say, hey, everybody, you know, this was made possible by this person and this organization, you know, let's, let's thank them. Um, and yeah, it, goes, it goes back to your visibility again, making sure that you have avenues to thank them, thank them at the event, mm -hmm. before, after, if you have a website, you know, making sure they're visible. But the, as far as like actual business returns themselves, I don't think you can give them any particular expectations. That's really for them to determine. Most of the sponsors that are giving you money are going to base it on sort of goodwill and to get visibility for themselves, and they're going to do some calculations to determine what kind of return they're getting on that visibility, but I don't think that you in particular can set that expectation for them at an event. Right. It, it, it's possible um, to... It depends on the focus of your event and the audience and the people who are attending... Uh, but if you're trying to, uh, like for example, um, Dev Days is coming up in France, and one of the things that we're going to focus on there is performance. So if you have a sponsor who is running a gigantic project and performance is really important to them, right, the return that they could get on helping to sponsor this event is, you know, better performance. But... Uh, most, I think, practical returns that you can tell, like you can communicate with your sponsors, like if you're going to talk to them and they're going to say, well, what am I going to get out of this? Uh, it's going to be visibility in the community. And the way that uh, that ends up benefiting a lot of organizations is that they are going to be able to hire better people and better people are going to want to work for them. So I think the return for investors is a very long-term return and revolves more about around visibility and what you get from that visibility is you get better people working for you. Great. Um, we've got a couple of comments just thanking our presenters and I will join them. Uh, thank you, Kathy and David, for taking the time to work on this and uh, of course being a, a mentor in your own uh, local area and globally, I think uh, it, is, it is really fantastic to uh, be able to work with such enthusiastic volunteers. So I, I really appreciate your time. Just a quick reminder, uh, if you're still on the call, please take the survey. It's just five questions. It will help us uh, go uh, forward and know a little bit about uh, who is planning sprints and how can we uh, address that properly. So um, we thank you for your time. We will be recording uh, this session and, and posting it on our YouTube channel. And then, of course, we will have the slides available so uh, you can share that with your local community uh, as well. Thank you for your uh, time. I think that the, the one thing we forgot to mention was sure. that. Uh, the DA has a uh, newsletter for organizers. Uh, so in addition to the Sprint Resources page that we have, people should watch out for um, an email that they get 
or announcements about that and I highly encourage people to sign up for that newsletter and uh, that will help disseminate some of the more details about information about having events and organizing things. Great. Thanks, Kathy. Completely forgot. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, you know, of course, we have listed uh, in our email that you'll get later this week with the recording. You can see our other webcasts coming up. We have one on Drupal uh, 8 accessibility that is going to be really exciting, hopefully at the end of April. And uh, we'll have another one coming up on uh, Drupal CI and a wrap up of what happened at the last sprint. So we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks so much.